Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have John Lederer, a portfolio manager, and Brett Owens, the chief investment strategist of Contrarian Outlook. Uh, on the program today, we are uh, on Channel 17 in Sacramento, uh, Access Sacramento, as well as uh, uh, www.accesssacramento.org on Yahoo, on YouTube, and on cable channels all over the place at 8 p.m. Thursday, noon Friday, and 4 a.m. Saturday. The United States Supreme Court ruled that civil asset forfeiture can be a violation of the Eighth Amendment against excessive fines. Uh, Brett, tell us a little bit about that. Well, the uh, case here was an excessive fine. I think it was against a uh, kind of a low-level drug dealer yes. who got busted dealing yes. uh, a couple hundred bucks worth of heroin to undercover officers. Yes. Uh, the government then, uh, I think it was the state, State of Indiana. State of Indiana went ahead and they uh, and they took his car, right? Took his Land Rover. So forty thousand dollar. Forty two thousand. Forty two thousand dollar fine on a two hundred dollar, uh, little two hundred dollar pedal. Well, that was on top of the twelve hundred dollar fine that he had to pay, plus uh, a year of uh, house arrest and five years of probation. That's right. Yeah. So good job by the Supreme Court on this one. Justice uh, Ginsburg mentioned excessive fines being an important part throughout Anglo American history. So we traced it back. She mentioned the Eighth Amendment, which was 1791. Uh, it goes all the way back to the English Bill of Rights, 1689. Uh, excessive fines mentioned there. Uh, no good. So good job by the Supreme Court. You always got to follow that English common law, especially from that Magna Carta on. From that, that That's kind of the sweet spot from that 1215, 1689 era. It got that's, better and better and better. It got better and better and still, better. Until it's, still, it, it's still getting better. Uh, I mean, it went down yeah. a little bit for, for went, a while. Gentlemen, yeah. good luck on your show tonight, okay? Uh, <laughs> We're the only ones that get to go live in this place now. We've got almost 1,400 shows. So this is okay. Awesome. And uh, the uh, history of civil asset forfeiture. Tell us a little bit about uh, how we got to a point where uh, police officers could essentially conduct highway robbery uh, on uh, people who were not even convicted, or much less even charged for a crime in some, in some cases. How did we get there? Well, how did we get there? Well, the uh, uh, poor uh, Tyson Timms here who was hit up uh, by, if this case hadn't found its way up to the Supreme Court, uh, poor Tyson would have had that $42,000 fine for this little low-level deal. There's no recourse for uh, someone who's hit with the excessive fine. That's why this is uh, something that if, if, it, if it happens to you uh, and you're not in a position to hire an attorney to yeah, well, uh, fight there's the a case. Recourse. The recourse is that you have to, uh, they, they take your car or they take your cash or they take whatever, whatever they, uh, they think you know, that you happen to have with you when they suspect you of a crime, drug crime or others or otherwise. Guilty till proven innocent. And yeah, and then mm -hmm. you have to sue the police department to get your own property back at a, a very high cost of uh, legal fees for your for you know for your own attorney. It's not free legal. It's not, you know, a free legal help from the government or anything. You have to hire your own private criminal uh, attorney or a specialist in civil asset forfeiture. Uh, and and then maybe you'll get it back, maybe you won't. Uh, because it's very difficult to prove a negative. No, I wasn't uh, doing drugs. Uh, how do you prove that? Uh, they can't prove that you were, but they don't have to. This amendment or this uh, ruling by the Supreme Court is actually probably one of the more momentous rulings that we've seen in quite some time when it comes to civil liberties. It's really fascinating to me that it was a unanimous opinion. Kavanaugh and Gorsuch and Thomas and uh, Alito joined Ginsburg and the liberals on the court. It was uh, across the board. Uh, they agreed. A couple of the judges thought that it should have been not under the due process clause, but under the privileges and immunities clause, both part of the 14th Amendment. The end result would have been the same. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is on the amicus side of the, of the uh, uh, case, we had uh, people like, uh, well, it was, it, the case was, was handled pro bono, by the way, by uh, the IJ, Institute for Justice, which is a libertarian uh, uh, public interest law firm based in, DC, or, uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. Amicus included the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is here in Sacramento, as well as uh, the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, uh, the uh, Criminal Defense Fund, uh, which is a, a left-leaning uh, uh, organization, uh, and uh, Judicial Watch, which is right-leaning, the Chamber of Commerce, which is, of course, business-oriented. Uh, They're concerned about it because business owners quite often get hit with, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, asset forfeiture laws. You are running a hotel. Uh, we think there's prostitution going on. We get, we're going to take the hotel. 
that's that's the kind of uh, the kind of abuse that was going on uh, with the asset forfeiture laws. Now it doesn't eliminate asset forfeiture. Uh, under the ruling, it has to go back to the Indiana uh, courts, and they have to come up with a, a forfeiture that is in line with the, the actual fine, which is, in this case, was $1,200. Could have been as much as $10,000, but it sure as heck wasn't $42,000. So asset forfeitures are still on the books. It's just not a blank check anymore, because that's what it was before. They could take your motorhome if they thought that you had an ounce of marijuana in it. And then up to you to and hire the lawyers, pay the legal yeah, fees, exactly. may not be worth it. Exactly. So a, a momentous decision, fine decision by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the other thing that's been making news in the last week or so is the uh, situation in Venezuela, which of course has been going on since uh, back in the 90s when Hugo Chavez mm -hmm. won an election. He won fair and square. He won a democratic election, became the uh, president of Venezuela, and immediately uh, went all Stalin. I mean, he went a uh, full bore uh, socialist. Uh, he uh, confiscated the oil industry without compensation to the oil companies, uh, took, all of, took over all of the oil companies as well as a whole bunch of other industry, turned it into a socialist state, which worked sort of well uh, because he was, he was, you know, skating on high oil prices. When oil prices went south, he, um, uh, Chavez died, uh, his, hand, his right hand man, Maduro, uh, took over. And uh, it's a basket case. The uh, inflation in Venezuela is millions of percent per year. Uh, there's disease rampant. People are trying to uh, flee by going over 12,000 foot mountain passes to get into Colombia or Brazil or elsewhere. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a terrible situation. And of course, our uh, illustrious president decided he wanted to fix that. Donald Trump said, uh, held a press conference, said, we're going to go into Venezuela and uh, you know we're going to all cards are on the table is is the the phraseology that he used. Or all or all options are open. What's wrong with that? Well, first, uh, going back to our British analogy, we're not good at building democracies. British are better, so I think we should defer to the masters and let them go ahead and and, and set up U.S., New Zealand, Australia uh, if we're going to go at it. But uh, otherwise, I don't think we have a good uh, a track record of lasting democracy building. Correct me if I'm Yeah, no, I think, here, so. I think I would agree with mm -hmm. that. I mean, it's just a question of, you know, how much bandwidth do we have to get involved in these situations? I mean, we've seen where we've gone in and tried to intervene in some of these other countries. I mean, you know, Iraq, is, I don't think was a success story in terms of our going in and, um, you know, trying to fix a situation there. I think in, in many respects, you know, it really altered the balance of power in the Middle East by going through and, uh, doing some of those things. I mean, it's like you said, it's really an unfortunate situation that, you know, whenever you let socialism go on for long enough, um, you know, the results tend to not be very good. And this is certainly a tragic situation, but I don't think the answer of our going in and um, trying to restore the institutions and everything else is going to be like the, the, the cure-all there. I think, um, you know, trying to, um, um, you know, go through and, you um, you know, let them kind of figure some things out. And I mean, I think if oil, as you said before, oil, I think if oil weren't in play in this situation, I mean, there's plenty of other countries that have very bad situations and we don't seem to be too interested if there's no oil involved. Oh, you think so we I have think, an ulterior motive? Yeah, <laughs> I think that could be the case, which is an interesting point because, you know, I think the U.S. in many respects is always worried about, you know, major oil producer going offline and you know what that would do to, to oil prices. But I mean, we have a pretty healthy shale production uh, here in the US now. We're exporting oil now. Yeah, I mean, we have. And so the issue is, is that you know, for shale production to be successful here, we actually kind of need oil prices to get a little bit higher so that you know, US oil producers can make more money. It's, it's more advantageous for them if that happens. And that does bring more money here. So it kind of seems a bit hypocritical when we're trying to go through and prevent these things from happening. I know that, you know, governments don't want to see, you know, inflation and oil prices. But at the same time, I think, you know, as long as prices weren't, don't spike too high, I think there's a lot of benefit for, you know, I think when oil got around $70 a share, a lot of the producers in the Bakken, uh, you know, th those projects start to pencil out. And then when that happens, there's a lot of other benefits because when can the U.S. can produce energy efficiently, you don't really need to go out and, you know, it makes manufacturing here look more attractive because, you know, energy prices are low and, um, 
you know, it, it, it's a lot more incentive to want to produce here. The catalyst in this particular case was uh, a guy, and I'm going to I'm going to butcher the name Juan Guaido or something mm -hmm. like that, uh, who is a the leader of the uh, Venezuelan. Uh, Assembly, uh, I forget the name of the, the legislative body, mm -hmm. which is basically toothless. Maduro has uh, basically uh, uh, eliminated any power that the legislative uh, body has. But anyway, he's the head of that legislative body, and he declared himself the interim president uh, and was immediately recognized by the United States and a, a number of other countries. As far as I can tell, this guy is a blank slate. He might be a good guy. He might be not so good. We have no idea wh where he's coming from. He might be even more socialist than Maduro. We don't know. Uh, it'd be kind of hard to be bad, worse than Maduro, but we don't we really don't know. Uh, and even if we were able to affect regime change and get rid of Maduro, Maduro was elected democratically, maybe. Certainly Hugo Chavez was elected democratically. There's a huge base of people in Venezuela who would probably say, Yankee interventionists, Yankees go home, uh, and end up basically blowing up in our face uh, the way it did in Afghanistan, yeah. the way it did in uh, Somalia, the way it did in Libya, the way it ha it's probably going to do if we if we keep staying there in Syria. You mentioned Iraq. Iraq, I think, is a great case of that uh, as well. Yeah. So you know, letting a, a country, and, and then if you take a, and I look at the socialist countries that have uh, gone another direction not because we made them, but because they basically bottomed out. I'm talking about all of Eastern Europe, mm. East Germany, Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, Hungary, all of the Eastern European countries, they're doing very well, thank you very much. And they're not mad at us, because we didn't go in there and try to uh, tell them what they needed to be doing. Yeah, and, Chile's and, a nice South American example, yeah. getting their extra. We, we, we actually ha did have, an, have a role there. That's why I, I avoided it. <laughs> <Okay. about that. laughs> And, but but and, the, the, uh, the CIA, yeah. but, and that's one, that's the exception. Maybe we just need to send the CIA in. Yeah, well, keep, the CIA. Keep, keep it light. Yeah, yeah. But, well, but, yeah. If, but if you look at what we did, you know, after the, after the wall fell in the early 90s, I mean, we established trade relationships and helped, you know, build businesses and things like that that helped their economies come from really being decimated. And arguably, that's been one of the main reasons why those countries have, have succeeded. Yeah, absolutely. We lost the American War. That's what the Vietnamese call the Vietnamese War. They call it the American War. And rightfully so. We were invading their country for no really good reason, which we knew, or I knew, many, many people, you know, the war protesters knew at the time. And, uh, but shortly after the war, not too, long, not too many years after the war ended, we established open trade relationships mm -hmm. with, uh, with Vietnam and treated them like, any, like, you know, like any other nation. And the country is prospering. And they don't hold a whole lot of ill will toward us, even though they certainly could, uh, considering the bombing and uh, Agent Orange and, and other uh, damage we did to that country. But trade and honest relationships with countries, leading by example, does a whole lot more than going in there and saying, we don't like this leader, let's put in a different leader. Uh, and uh, it, all that does is it, it, it just breeds resentment. And we've got that same kind of resentment going on in the Middle East now, where we've tried to install our own uh, brand of, uh, of, of, of despot. To get, you know, we got rid of Gaddafi, we got rid of uh, Saddam Hussein, but are the people who replace them any better? Right. Doubtful. That's the problem. Who do you replace them with? Yeah. Uh, and you don't know because you're working with blank slates. You don't know who, who your so-called allies are until they actually have power. So uh, socialism is wrong, uh, but the U.S. intervention is the wrong cure. Guns, drugs, politics of fear. Uh, we have a Democratic House of Representatives now, and they're gung-ho on passing a whole lot of uh, drug, uh, gun, gun regulation, uh, gun control regulation, whether it's magazine size, whether it's transfers of firearms, any of those things going anywhere, any of the, those uh, things have any merit. Guns might. Guns might. I think we need to look at what other countries have done with guns because our, I got some stats here for you. Okay. Okay. Stats are good. Deaths per 100,000 people. U.S. 11 per 100,000. Then give you a little perspective here. <clears throat> Australia 1, United Kingdom 0 0.2, France 2.83, Germany 1, Israel 2, Colombia 18. So Colombia more gun deaths than, than us. So our... Ratio versus other countries, I would think we put look on up our peer are not good. <coughs> did you look up Switzerland by any chance? It was on the it was on the page. I did not see Switzerland. You know it offhand. I don't know it, but okay. I'm, I'm okay. guessing it's probably less than some of those other countries that you mentioned. 
And the interesting thing about Switzerland is that they require everybody, every able-bodied citizen to, to own a gun. Every uh, adult, male, maybe female, I'm not sure, has to own an automatic weapon and keep it in their home. Fully loaded, or not fully loaded, but you know, having a full stock of ammunition uh, close by uh, for their own uh, civil defense uh, reasons. And they have a very low uh, crime when it comes to uh, gun violence. So I'm not sure that there's a correlation between uh, stout gun control laws and uh, gun deaths. Well, it's tough. It could be a country size <coughs> thing also. Israel, I don't know the number of guns in Israel, but I think more per capita guns and a low gun death ratio similar to Switzerland. I, I, I actually visited uh, Israel several years ago and uh, it's not unusual. In fact, it is very usual to see young Israeli uh, men and women in the armed forces sporting their Uzis in, uh, in, in Denny's or coffee shops or, you know, restaurants. They just, you know, that's, it's a matter of course that everybody, uh, at least in the military, is armed. And uh, I noticed that a, a watchman at our hotel was also armed. Uh, I don't know what the uh, laws are, but I know that, you know, it's not difficult to arm yourself in Israel. Course, could be, yeah. Could be a size thing. Less countries, less crazy people. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> we got a bigger pull to pull from. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the things about one of those gun laws is that it would it would criminalize. This is the uh, transfer law. It would criminalize uh, transfers, uh, except in certain instances. It would still be okay for uh, an uncle to give a gun or transfer a gun to his niece or nephew without uh, paperwork, without reporting it. However, it would be illegal with, uh, I think it's a $10,000 fine or, so, or such, for him to transfer that same gun to his cousin. I don't understand uh, how, <laughs> how they're making a distinction between uh, which siblings or which family member, which kin uh, make sense to uh, transfer guns to and which don't. Sounds like a money grab. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next topic, um, the border wall. This is a big one. Uh, it's the... Uh, uh, the, the, the primary campaign promise of the, uh, of the Trump campaign and what he's been doing is damn to deliver on ever since he got elected, and particularly in the last couple of months. Uh, the border wall, is that something that we uh, uh, should uh, uh, look forward to going up anytime soon? I sure hope not. I mean, <laughs> uh, it just seems, uh, you know, I mean, this idea that if you build this wall of, you know, it's not even going to be a full go across the entire border, it's going to be on certain stretch of border. I mean, people are pretty clever. They figure other ways to get around things. Are they building that, the tunnels in parallel? From yeah, the other side? exactly. Exactly. I mean, I just don't see, you know, walls just don't work. I mean, we went and Reagan said, you know, tear down this wall. And we saw what happened after the wall got torn down. I mean, you know, you bring people online, you know, immigration is a good thing in many respects because, you know, uh, supply of labor. You got people that are hungry for jobs and, uh, you know, a lot of times are very uh, capable workers that can come in and are willing to do the work. And, um, you know, I just think the wall is, you know, I mean, he's just pandering to his base. And uh, Well, it's, yeah, it's, and, I, and, and the, the thing about that base is the, the, the fear of immigration. There are a whole lot of people that are really, really afraid that immigrants are going to come and take my job. Right. And the fact is that Every immigrant that comes here and takes a job is also going to spend money here and create other jobs Correct. to supply what he's spending his money on. Correct. So it's a, it's a win-win. I mean, people who earn money, spend money, other jobs are created in order to provide the goods that uh, that the immigrant is, is spending. Yeah, I mean, and the irony is, too, is a lot of these people in that base, you know, their ancestors 100 years ago were on the other side of that, where they were probably the ones who were coming over and getting, you know, uh, you know, the demagoguery was against their, you know, certain class of people or certain race. And now, you know, it's kind of turned. So, I mean, these things have been happening for hundreds of years in this country. I mean, immigrants are always, there's always this fear of people coming in and, you know, harming your way of life and your, and yeah, your, fear your of the standard other. of living. Yeah, fear, exactly. fear of the other. I mean, uh, all of the rhetoric, and it's all anecdotal, none of it's backed by statistics. The anecdotal uh, fear generated is that you have to fear immigrants because they're going to uh, murder you or uh, kidnap you or traffic in your women or, you know, all kinds of vile things, when, in fact, the statistics would indicate that immigrants are less 
crime prone than right. Native Americans. They're uh, more uh, willing to to work hard uh, and keep a job, less apt to go on welfare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. They are in fact better citizens than than people who were born here on average. Yeah, I mean, look at the look at what it takes. I mean, it's a scary endeavor to go to a country with nothing and you know go to a completely different place. A lot of times you don't know the language. I mean, a person who's willing to do that already has a makeup that you know is somewhere where you know, their chance of success is probably going to be a lot higher than somebody that has never really had to do anything or take any risks. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the ambitious people who are right. going to be the immigrants. Exactly. They're the and the self-starters, to, yeah. The self-starters, mm-hmm. the people who actually want to improve their lives Correct. and do so honestly. Those are the people who are going to uh, cross a border and, and venture into the unknown. The people who just want to get by, they're going to stay home and fish. Right. Well, we made a living off that as a country for 250 some years, just skimming off the top. We get the best and brightest, bring them over here. And we forget. We're all in. Yeah, we forget when, when Britain was a socialist country before, you know, pre Thatcher, uh, more socialist country. And uh, they had a brain drain. All of the, the best and the brightest of, of the Brits were moving to mm-hmm. the United mm-hmm. States. Brain drain. We're having a brain drain right now, or could be having a brain drain of immigrants. Well, we're, we have one, Sergey Brin coming from Russia, and uh, you know the, the 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 top executives at a whole lot of tech firms are not United States. Uh, totally. Lawyers. I think about. I, half I was just gonna. I was just gonna say that I saw a stat on Twitter. I think it was yesterday. Of like they had like top twenty five companies of market cap, and like I think the majority of them were started. By first or second generation immigrants, right. I mean, all, you know, the the great majority of them. Right. So if you look at the, you know small business, if you go to a, a pizza parlor or a nail shop, there, there's probably a ten to one chance that it's, that it's run by an immigrant of some mm-hmm. kind, either a Vietnamese or by uh, an Iranian or you name it. I mean, it's it's the immigrants who are running small business as well as large business mm-hmm. and creating the jobs that people are afraid of losing. So uh, the uh, idea that a border wall will solve any problems, I think, I think the, uh, the fear we, we, we need to engender is uh, a border wall makes it more difficult to cross a border. You can always go over it with a ladder or under it with a tunnel or around the end. But the fear we have to uh, have is whether that wall is there to keep people out or to keep us in. That's what I worry about. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, Gallup. Gallup polling says there are a record number of Americans who call government the biggest problem. Uh, and that's a, a number that has been going up over the years. And it's easy to see why. We see dysfunction, the uh, government shut down most recently, and just all kinds of, you know, $22, $22 billion in, in a federal deficit. Uh, is this an opportunity for libertarians, uh, a la Ron Paul? Or is it a, a, an opportunity for socialists, all, uh, Bernie Sanders? We did our own Gallup poll last time <laughs> I was on the show, Richard. We went to the uh, the bar after for beers yeah, yeah. with the host, John, the guest yeah, host. Yeah. And we did a little polling around the bar. And yeah. they said, well, where are you guys coming from? We had the, the suit coats on. So yeah. it was a little unusual. So we explained the show. And they said, well, libertarian, what does a libertarian believe? Well, I believe in liberty. So you can do whatever you want. And the government doesn't mess with you too much. And... People thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, sounds cool. Yeah. I guess I'm a libertarian yeah. also. Yeah. To me, that's the Ron Paul take on things. He's, he's very kind of middle of the road. Uh, he doesn't take uh, anything too far to the extreme. A pretty reasonable guy. I think that's the opportunity for libertarians. I think there's more overlap between a Bernie base and a Ron Paul base than you would, th- you would think they would be out here. But there's uh, much more overlap, I think, in terms of potential addressable market. Uh, but it's about kind of explaining, I think, libertarianism in that reasonable, easy to understand way, and uh, also kind of staying on the middle of the road and not getting too far out, not saying that no government, anything, because that's just not possible anyway. So taking more of that practical approach. I think a lot of the stuff that Ron said was people could uh, relate to. We don't belong in Iraq. Government shouldn't be telling you what to do. This, this, so I I think that type of uh, down home message, sort of that classic liberal thing will, uh, will resonate if explained well. Not who's going to explain it well. I was looking at the list of candidates, and I'm not sure who that guy's going to be. I thought uh, McAfee might be an interesting candidate until I saw all he wants to do is talk about cryptocurrency. So I'm not well, sure. That, that, he's, got, he's got an interesting history from his time in Belize. I, I don't know if you're aware of that. No, I'm not. Yeah, well, uh, I, I own some property in Belize, so I, I, I'm intimately yeah. familiar with his, his adventures in Belize. And I, I'm not making any accusations at all, but he uh, was under investigation, or he was, a, he was a, a person of interest 
uh, in in a uh, a murder mystery. This I, I, read, yet, I read about that. Yeah. The Belize so, authorities by the Belize. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and he's not going back to Belize anytime mm-hmm. soon. So that would probably dog or be the primary uh, uh, topic of conversation were he to be a Libertarian Party candidate. Uh, I, you know, he's not. So I, well, I mean, he may be, I, and I I have you know I I don't know. Uh, he he may be the best for all I know. <laughs> But there, there, are, you know, there are there are issues. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see who the libertarians say. Uh, yeah, you figure at least he's got some money to throw at the thing, so he could he could, he could get himself out there. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm Whether or not he'd want him out there would yeah, be another yeah. another issue. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, uh, recently, uh, Donald Trump uh, carried on uh, an Obama administration policy, which uh, was to advocate the decriminalization of of uh, the illegality of homosexual uh, homosexuality uh, worldwide. Uh, he's been attacked by the LBGT community by a writer at Out and by other LGBT spokespeople. What is it? Th- why, why would that be? I think he's just up against it. There, I don't. Uh, I don't. I can't think of one person offhand in the LGBT community who would have anything nice to say about Donald <laughs> Trump. So I think it's one of those things where uh, I think no matter what he does uh, on that side of things. He's going to be criticized. Well, that's the other thing. I mean, he, he said we, we should get out of Syria. We should get out, get out of Af- Afghanistan, which has been, uh, you know, a, a siren call from the left for, for, you know, for, well, ever since George mm-hmm. W. Bush got us in there in the first place. But now, uh, all of a sudden, they've turned into neocons. What's that all about? Yes, yeah, so where the politics are so polarized today, that's where I think the libertarian, uh, like a, a Ron Paul type, who can kind of bridge the gap in the middle, because otherwise you're not seeing anything in the, in the middle these days. It's over here, over here, and anything said from uh, the right is rejected by the left. Anything said from the left rejected by uh, the right. It's almost like a knee-jerk so reaction. The, it, so on it's, a, it's a tribalization of politics. If you're not in Very my tribe, if you're yeah. not in my tribe, yeah, I think there's everything, a lot to that. Yeah. Everything you say is wrong, and I will attack you, uh, you know, with everything I've got, even if I agree with you. Yeah, there used to be that old saying: the primaries were to determine the candidates, and then it, it was resolved in, in the middle with the general election. And I think that was probably true as recently as the '90s, and it doesn't seem to be true anymore. It's the tribal well, yeah, thing. The primaries just yeah, well, I mean, continue Bill, on. Bill, Bill Clinton was a, a centrist candidate for all of his uh, baggage as far as his politics are concerned he was very much centrist he he uh, was uh, able to uh, actually get the, the the government budget somewhere close to balance for for a couple of years and he uh, uh, did some deregulatory stuff I, he, was, he was a centrist guy welfare did some welfare cleanup welfare, yeah. yeah welfare reform his wife not so much but, uh, <laughs> but that's that's the politics that we're in today <laughs> that's the show for this week we'll see you again next week same time place same time same place on the libertarian counterpoint thank you